Okay, um, well, we're thrilled to have Zico Coulter with us today. So Zico is a professor of computer science at Carnegie Mellon, and he works on a wide range of topics in machine learning, from uh, machine learning for energy efficiency to uh, all sorts of beautiful work on the theory and empirical analysis of deep learning methods. So we're excited to see what he has for us today. All right. Uh, let me know if, if, if the, the audio starts to fade or anything to any point. I'm, I'm, uh, I'll try to watch out for anything. Uh, well, uh, it's wonderful to, to virtually be here. Uh, thanks very much for the introduction, uh, Sanjay. And I'm um, uh, so, not Sanjay. <laughs> Uh, uh, sorry, I think people feel confused there. Um, it's it, it's uh, it's wonderful to be here. Thanks very much for the introduction, um, Sanjay, and uh, and uh, excited to to be talking um, in this in this workshop, kind of at the intersection of optimization and machine learning, because this is actually the exact kind of topic of, of this talk here, and it's exactly the kind of the kind of work that I that I uh, find most exciting about a lot of work, a lot, a lot of. Uh, machine learning, including sort of modern machine learning that you know maybe has drifted away a little bit from context optimization and these things. So what I'm going to talk about today is a, a talk on um, some new models, new classes of models we've been working on recently um, in the group. Um, particularly, just where I'm going to talk about this this new class of model called deep equilibrium models. Um, but that's sort of the first half of the talk, and this is largely following a paper um, that appeared this last year in NeurIPS. Uh, the second half of the talk, though, is going to be about um, kind of trying to expand a little bit of, on the theory uh, of these methods using a technique called uh, monotone operators, or using a, a framework called monotone operators. So um, this is, a, and this work is actually appearing soon uh, in a preprint. It's not, it's not available yet, but it will be uh, shortly. So if you're, if you're listening to the talk and curious uh, to find out more information, um, send me an email, and I'm happy to share the link when, when we post the preprint. So at a high level, what does this talk about? Um, what this talk about is about is about the story we all tell about deep learning um, and why this might actually be, be wrong. Um, so we, we've all heard this story of machine learning, right? Where, or, or deep learning, um, where we sort of say, okay, well, you know, what deep learning does at a high level is that it, it builds this hierarchical representation of features, right? So this, this famous picture, um, actually to be clear, this picture is not just prepared out of the ether. It actually was um, by, by uh, well, a number of authors, including my, my office mate in grad school, Hong Lak Lee. Uh, and uh, I remember him actually generating these figures uh, in, when, when I was sitting next, sitting, sitting nearby him in the office. So I didn't know I was you know, such a part of history at that, but it looks like I was. Uh, these figures are everywhere. And there's this notion that you know, at the lower levels of the network, you do things like find edges and, and you know, you know, small features and, and images. Then you identify maybe parts of images like eyes or noses and stuff. And then you construct things like faces uh, as you go. Uh, and that's how, you know, that's, that's how these hierarchical structures in deep networks kind of work. And um, what I want to do today is offer a little bit of, uh, I mean, this is clearly a, 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 a true phenomenon, but I want to argue for a little bit different perspective on what depth is in deep networks. So in particular, I'm going to talk about a different form of architecture, um, which lets us, which we call the deep equilibrium model, uh, or DEC. And this will let us actually replace a networks with a single uh, place deep deep networks networks with many different layers uh, with networks with a single can you everyone see my my pointer it's not ideal but I guess I'll I'll use it around a little bit uh, replace these sort of traditional deep networks with a single hidden layer network uh, and to be clear what I'm not, I'm not talking here about like these universal function approximation theorems where that one hidden layer is is exponentially wide I'm talking about a model with the exact same number of parameters, but which has only one layer. Um, and it will in fact work just as well as these very deep models. Um, but to do that, you'll have to grant me a kind of a different kind of layer. So, and I'll, I'll, I'll mention this a lot more later on, but we're going to move, instead of thinking about layers as explicit functions, we're gonna think about layers as being implicitly defined. They're defined in terms of a set of equations we want them to satisfy. So this is going to be two parts of the talk. Uh, and in the first part of the talk, I'm going to uh, talk about these uh, deep equilibrium models, which is this work from, from NeurIPS. And the second part of the talk, though, uh, I'm going to highlight a few of the problems with these, with these models. 
and then point out how to how we can actually uh, like, like the problems being things like existence and uniqueness of the fixed points that we're going to consider in these models. And then I'll talk about how we can use tools from uh, what's called monotone operator theory, uh, which is you know a, a, a theory underlying a lot of convex optimization, for example, to actually address some of these problems and come up with new classes of these equilibrium models that have very nice properties um, and which you know offer a direction forward for for pursuing these things. So that's going to be the, the 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 rough outline. I actually realized that somehow my my outline size got deleted. That, that's okay. I'll just I'll just stop and pause when I'm reaching the second part of the talk. But in this first part, we're going to talk about this first bit here, about the deep equilibrium model as a whole. Um, so the code, by the way, we don't see the pointer. Oh, you don't see the pointer. OK, uh, let's see if I can. Uh, let's see. Do you see it now if I do this? No? OK, that's fine. Well, I'll have to deal with. Uh, you can you, you see me sort of waving around in the group, right? So you can imagine that I'm waving at a portion of the slide. <laughs> uh, okay, so um, now this seems I, I I admit this this seems sort of odd and unbelievable at first, right? Because we've we've, we've we've all sort of you know it's been well established that there are certain certain functions that you know you need a deep network to represent, or there you know there are circuits that are easily representable with with some depth, but not with a fixed layer. So what do I actually mean here um, when I say this? And so I'm going to sort of now take us on this, this path to get to arrive at what I mean by these single deep equilibrium models that work with a single layer. And the starting point for this is going to be thinking about a, a class of networks that I'm going to call weight tied input injected models. So in a traditional deep learning model, and this is, of course, you know, there can be additional connections and stuff. This is a very sort of simple feed forward network. But in a simple feedforward network, we think of the layers in a network being computed kind of sequentially, one after the other, right? So z i plus 1, the i plus 1 layer is some nonlinear function of a linear operator w times z i plus you know, a, a bias term. And that linear operator uh, w i could, could be a matrix, but it could also be a convolution, these kinds of things. Um, now, of course, people get much fancier with these things. Um, there are things like uh, uh, residual layers and, and actually much more complex um, you know, self-attention, things like this. Um, but, but for now, let's just, let's just think about these, these simple layers. Most of those other things can also be handled very, very easily as well. Um, and so let's just think about a network in terms of the simple sort of steps of a feedforward process. And as a starting point for our kind of new perspective on this, or, or really actually this is not that new, this is going back, you know, similar pictures go back uh, many decades, but for a revisiting of some of these new ideas and, and, and some new concepts here. Um, we're going to consider a different, slightly different variant of this network, which is what we're calling a weight tied input injected um, network. So here, instead of there being a different weight at each layer, um, it turns out we can, we're going to use the same weight. So, you know, the I plus one activation is still equal to a nonlinear function of a linear operator uh, applied to the previous layer. But here we're going to do two different things. We're going to fix W. So W is constant across the entire network. Um, so we were always applying the same linear operator. And we're also going to inject the input into each layer. And both of those things are actually very important. I'll talk about why we do both of those things in a second. But that's going to be our new, our new kind of network we're going to consider here. Um, now, you might argue that this is actually a very restricted form of network. It turns out it's actually not. Um, theoretically, by a very simple argument, you can embed any sort of traditional network inside one of these networks with no increase in parameters or anything. I'm actually not going to go through that proof. It's sort of a very simple sort of uh, stacking kind of argument. Um, and and uh, it's, it's in our paper if, if, if you want to see that. But sort of the, the, the end point is that this is not really that much of a restriction. Um, and you still get very powerful you know, effects of traditional depth when you apply these, these uh, weight tied uh, networks. So this actually relates to a long history of, of work in, um, in deep learning. So uh, if, if, if you sort of look at this network, you actually probably realize this looks very similar to a recurrent network, right? You can sort of think of the recurrence as being um, repeated application of the same, the, same, um, the, the, the same weight matrix sort of over time, right? It's just not, we're not thinking about time here so much as we're thinking about, about depth of the model, but it's, it's a very similar concept. And actually, and, and to a certain extent, you know, to a certain 
perspective, uh, these methods all have a lot of roots in, in things like recurrent backpropagation, uh, which goes back to the, to the uh, uh, late 80s and early 90s. And actually, a lot of these ideas are, are you know, a revisiting of some of those, some of those original ideas there. Um, there's also been some recent advances that also kind of revisit those notions. Um, so some work by Renji Liao uh, in recent years and, and co-authors um, revisited this recurrent backprop. Uh, it's also actually very similar to neural ODEs. It's sort of like a continuous, it's sort of like discrete time uh, dynamical system, much like neural ODEs or a continuous time dynamical system. Um, and so there's all these nice connections between sort of past work. But I should also mention, maybe most importantly, um, these networks, they work just fine in practice in very large scale tasks. Uh, so there's been some work, uh, including work by 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 actually my, my student Xiao Ji, who's also um, working on, on on this deck paper on, on this deck work. Uh, previous to this, though, was doing some work on weight tied networks that actually you know perform as well as traditional recurrent networks. And there's also a lot of work now in weight tied transformers uh, networks, which which also in practice um, work tend to work basically as well as if you have different weights at each layer. So both kind of from a theoretical perspective, which I won't cover too much more, but from a theoretical perspective and a practical perspective, it's actually fine to think about these, these weight-tied networks. OK, so this is our starting point, this notion of a weight-tied network. Um, and now I want to argue that there's a way of interpreting this that's actually kind of interesting here, right? Because if you think about a deep network as just the repeated application of some function, Right, so this 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 function here again. I'm writing it in terms of, of, of linear operators here, but W could be structured. It could be convolutions. It can be what it can be what anything else you want. So if you think about kind of repeated application of these things, then a natural kind of question arises as to what is the sort of the the final point of this iteration that 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 sort of corresponds to an infinite depth network. Uh, and now a few things could happen, right? It could actually not converge. It could blow up, um, which for general nonlinear systems might happen. Uh, but it turns out that in practice, most networks um, tend to, when, when you repeat this structure again and again, they tend to converge to, at least eventually, maybe very slowly, but they tend to converge towards an equilibrium point here, which we're calling going to call Z star. So you converge to some point where repeated application of this function doesn't change the the, the, the output anymore. And this, in fact, is sort of this limit of an infinite depth network. Uh, and so what the deep equilibrium model that we're proposing does is that instead of trying to find that equilibrium point um, by, by just it, repeating that iteration or anything else, we can consider this at a slightly higher level and just try to, at least, if we, if we know that the infinite depth network computes this point, this point Z star, we can try to just directly compute that equilibrium point using you know, root finding procedures. Um, we actually use a, a method called, and, and, and it's actually called Broyden's method, um, which is a quasi-Newton method for root finding, but it doesn't really actually even matter how you go about finding it. All that matters is you want to find um, this, 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 um, this root. And then in practice, we also replace this, you know, this isn't, in practice, we do go a little bit more complex than this. So you know, it isn't maybe just a single nonlinear function like this, but maybe we have a few different sort of cells in our, in our nonlinear function that we're iterating, like a transformer cell or a residual block. But the basic idea is very similar. We have sort of a single cell that we want to iterate, or we want to just, not, I mean, not necessarily iterate, but we want to find um, the equilibrium point of. Right? And this is going to be the framework for the deep equilibrium model. Um, now I will. I'll just mention this right now. Um, I'll, I'll I'll highlight this later. But one of the points that that I actually won't go into this time, but which is the proof is in the paper, is that these models they can in fact capture any traditional feed forward model. You can embed one inside one of these equilibrium models, and finding the root is equivalent to finding the complete output of the entire traditional feed forward network. So that's a sort of a general property about these deck models. Um, maybe I'll let you pause here. So there are any questions? Uh, any questions in the in the chat, Sanjoy? Um, okay, so no questions as yet. Okay, perfect. Either it's very clear or not clear enough. <laughs> um, Okay, now this type of layer that we're talking about here, 
is actually belongs to a sort of a, a broad class of layers that have been growing a lot, that, that, that sort of have been um, getting a lot of attention in recent years in, in deep learning. So they belong to a class of layers that, that we call implicit layers. And these are layers that are defined implicitly, right? So, and, and what I mean by this is that instead of defining a layer directly in terms of a compute graph, we define the layer in terms of a condition that we want the output to satisfy. So in this case, the condition when they have to satisfy is that it obeys this uh, fixed point uh, function here. And while this notion of an equilibrium point is of course one instance of an implicit layer, there actually are many more uh, applications of implicit layers that I want to highlight here. So there's also been some work in, uh, by Matt Johnson and co-authors on composing uh, graphical models with deep learning systems. There's been some work um, by a former student of mine, Brandon Amos, on embedding optimization inside of, of deep networks. This is the OpNet architecture. Uh, there's been work on by, by Stephen Gould and authors, actually in a very similar vein to that, and, and, and some of it predating our work, but also now defining these deep declarative networks that, again, um, work by expressing minimization problems you want to solve as opposed to what you actually want to do. Um, Laura Alga uh, Laurent Algawi uh, has worked a lot in, in, in this field as well, has, has a paper on these implicit sort of models of deep learning. Uh, neural ODEs are also uh, an, an example of, of these sorts of things. Um, uh, they're a little, a little bit different, but you know, a, 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 an ODE solution is actually also an implicit kind of um, uh, output uh, of, of a layer. And in fact, actually the next speaker in this series, uh, as well as some of the organizers, <laughs> um, have also worked on doing things like using implicit learning or implicit layers within meta-learning to avoid the need to backprop through a complex, uh, a different, a, a complex optimization procedure. So this is actually a very powerful method that's, that's sort of um, becoming you know, more and more, uh, um, becoming more and more used these days. And uh, I just want to highlight this because though I say that DEX can sort of, you know, we can represent anything with one layer, um, to be clear, this is a very powerful form of layer, right? There's, there's these implicit layers that are kind of uniformly more powerful than, um, than what we get with traditional networks. Um, so there's a couple of questions. Yeah. Okay, so the first is, um, how do you arrive at the weight matrices, the, the W and the U? Yeah, so let's talk actually about that. So, so um, I'll get to that in a second, uh, because that part, so what I'm describing right now is just the form of the network. We'll talk in a second about training the network. That's the, that's the next part you have to do, of course. Uh, but that's actually my, my next slide is how you train uh, deck models. So I'm just setting up basically the, 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 the architecture right now. And then I'll talk about how you train them, which in this case means, you know, finding the parameters, uh, the W and the, and the, and the U, et cetera. And, um, and, and the, the second question is, um, how does the expressivity of the network change as you let the layer, the number of layers go to infinity implicitly? Right. So, so it doesn't, in some sense, there's no notion of the actual number of layers and the actual implicit layer, because there's only one layer, right? There's, there's really just one layer. Um, so what changes with what changes expressivity is not the depth because depth is always infinite in some sense. What changes expressivity here is really the width of the network, right? That that's the one kind of control knob you have to to make the network more expressive is increasing the width. Um, and so that's really the, the 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 knob you have, not the depth, because depth in some sense is if you're finding the equilibrium point, then depth is always infinite. Great. Great. Okay, so maybe let's now arrive at this at this uh, next next question here, which is, you know, how do we actually train this network here? Um, you know, I've defined it in terms of this this W matrix or linear operator, this U matrix linear operator um, by SB. Um, but of course, like any network that the challenge of the network is actually to, you know, tune those parameters in a way that it actually, you know, achieves some some function. I'm also going to draw this, these things occasionally as I do on the right. Um, I'm going to occasionally abbreviate, for simplicity, uh, I'm going to occasionally now abbreviate um, this, this big function, sigma of w, z, uh, z star plus et cetera, with just f of z star and x. So it's, it should be clear that you know, this function is a function both of the, you know, of, of, of the equilibrium point itself and of the input x that we're injecting into each layer. So the, the, in some sense, the, the forward pass in this network is what I've just described. So given some new input, uh, say an XY pair, 
that you want to try to fit your network to. I mean, of course, you'd have a training set and, and in reality and do a mini batch, uh, mini batches in training set. Uh, the first step is to actually compute the equilibrium point, of course, right? So this is the forward pass of the network. You compute the equilibrium point, and in our case, we compute it using Broyden's method. So this is a nonlinear root finding technique that lets us find, you know, try to directly find that equilibrium point. Um, then we do the standard thing. So, so now we have like our, you know, you can think of the, 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 the equilibrium point kind of as the last or second to last layer of the network. Uh, and of course, you know, it won't be the same size number of classes and things like that. So you, you apply one more linear operation. Um, and then you compute some loss function between your projected outputs, um, your just, you know, binary, your, 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 your multi-class logits and the true label uh, that you received for your example. And that's the that's the sort of the forward procedure is is compute the equilibrium point then compute the loss. Now the question is how do we compute the gradients with respect to those parameters? So here theta denotes you know w or u or b or if there are parameters within the activation function it will also denote those. How do you compute the gradient with respect to the to the parameters? That's what we need of course to run SGD and actually train these models. So the idea here is is actually you know. And the first pass is question quite seems quite simple, right? We're just going to apply the chain rule. So we know that the loss is a function of z star, and we know that z star is a function of the parameters. We're just gonna you know, I'll, you know, apply the chain rule there to get this, to get this equation. But there's there's of course a problem here, which is that this second term, which is the derivative of, or the really Jacobian, of the fixed point with respect to the parameters, this is not doesn't seem obvious how we compute this, right? This, this, seemed, this is sort of a derivative through an equilibrium point or an equilibrium point solver. Now, one thing we could do, which I actually want to mention just because I explicitly want to not advocate for it, is we could just unroll whatever procedure we use to compute the fixed point and call that our new network. So if we have Broyden's method, we could unroll Broyden's method and call that you know, our new, um, our new sort of fixed, you know, you know, uh, fixed depth network, I guess, right? However many board iterations, that's kind of your new effective depth of your network. But I actually don't want to do that because a that will waste, that'll be very wasteful, um, both computationally and also actually, especially memory wise, you have to sort of store all those intermediate iterates you're using to compute Broyden's method. That's just very, very um, computationally intensive. So I don't want to do that for that reason, practically. But it's also just not the right thing to do, right? We, in some sense, this equilibrium point is, it, it, it's the whole point is that we didn't want to think, worry about the computation about how we got there. We just wanted to get there. Um, and so I don't want to advocate for unrolling forward computation. I want to advocate for something else, which again, at this point is actually something else is, is, is quite straightforward. Um, but it's, but it's, but it's instead we're going to show how to compute that derivative or that Jacobian directly. And so here's the basic trick. Um, oops, this was supposed to be an animation that somehow got, uh, oh, well, I just have to, oops. My full screen there. Um, huh, it's got deleted. Okay, well, so, <laughs> apologies. This is a little bit simpler if it comes up term by term. Um, but just go for the first line there. So the first line is our fixed point equation for our system. Um, what we're going to do with that first equation is we're just going to differentiate both. And I'm also making explicit here the fact that, of course, z star, though we don't write it this way normally, z star, of course, is a function of our parameters. Because if I change my weights, I'll arrive at a different fixed point. So I'm going to make explicit here the fact that, uh, just notationally, that z star here is a function of theta. OK, so what the first thing we do is we just, well, what this whole thing, to be clear, is this whole thing is, is, a, is a very straightforward, actually, an application of what's called the implicit function theorem. It's sort of a, something going back to, I think, Cauchy in, uh, in calculus. It's a, it's a very well-established established tool here. Um, and it's actually even quite widely used these days in deep learning, though still not, um, maybe not you know, that well known. So I'm going to go kind of through what this process is. So in the first step, that first implication arrow, we're just going to differentiate both sides of this equation with respect to theta, our parameters. Then what I'm going to do in the second line here is I'm going to just apply the chain rule to that right-hand side of the equation. And when I do so, I get two other terms. So I get the first term there, which is the derivative of this function with respect to theta, 
at the fixed point. So this, this is just, you know, um, assuming that that value Z star is fixed and it's sort of already known, you just, you know, do one more sort of, you know, repeated pass of the, of the function F and differentiate that thing. That's that first term there. So there's, there's no, you know, Z star is now considered a, a fixed quantity is why I'm not writing it as a function of theta anymore. Plus, if I now differentiate the, the other term, I'll get um, the derivative uh, or the Jacobian of F with respect to Z star times uh, the Jacobian of Z star with respect to theta. So this is just, again, uh, actually that, that, that uh, again, that second implication arrow um, is just a simple application of the chain rule of multivariate calculus. And now we have an, actually a linear equation where there, those two terms that I'm highlighting there in green are, those are just standard automatic differentiation terms. Those are just, uh, you know, the, you, you can compute them with TensorFlow or PyTorch or whatever you want. And what's unknown is the thing on the left-hand side, and I guess also a term, same term on the right-hand side, which is the actual Jacobian that we want to compute. Um, and so now we just have actually a linear system of equations, and we can solve for it by just rearranging. Um, and what we get is that the uh, Jacobian that we care about, that we want, is equal to um, I minus the Jacobian of F with respect to uh, Z star times the uh, inverse times the derivative of um, F with respect to, the, our, to our parameters theta. So if you didn't really follow that, don't worry uh, too much. All the, the, the high level view here is that it's possible to get these, get this Jacobian, or actually you know, maybe more precisely, we don't actually ever compute that inverse fully. We just want to multiply by it. So it's possible to compute this um, Jacobian exactly at the fixed point, right? So, so all we're doing here is we're just looking at the fixed. We, we, have, we have to know the fixed point first. We have to compute it first. But once we compute, can compute it, we can apply this implicit function theorem to directly differentiate through the fixed point without having to unroll the forward computation procedure. This is of course, this Jacobian just like especially hard to solve for um, Okay, uh, Z, 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 your voice is. Um, it's my voice is cutting out. Okay, that's a lot better. Let's make sure that I'm using the right microphone. Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah um, uh, is it better now? Yeah, and then there's, there's also a couple of questions now. Okay. Okay, so the first question is, is it conceivable that the equilibrium point is not unique? Let me actually defer that to the whole second point part, because you're absolutely right. And let me say, uh, let me just defer that all to the second part of the talk. Okay, okay. And the... Um, and, and the second question is, is this F parameterized by theta? Yes, it is. So, so, so theta here denotes, um, so theta here denotes the collection of all the weights, you know, W, U, B, uh, and F is just my, my nonlinear function. So, so yes, uh, trivially parameterized by, right? So those are just the parameters of F. Okay, and, and, uh, and, and one last question, which is that during the training process then, is it the case that you are iterating between computing these fixed points between computing the fixed point and then tuning the weights. Yes. So, so maybe I'll just go to the next slide here. So, so the the um, the process of training is in the forward pass. You compute the fixed point, compute the loss. In the backward pass, I compute the gradients with respect to all my parameters. So, for example, you know, uh, maybe I should maybe more, make it more explicit there, but just say this is, you know, DL, DW, for example, um, would, would, would have this form here. And then I just do normal stochastic gradient descent. So then I just take a small step in the direction or, or you know, atom or whatever other optimizer you want. This is how I compute the gradients. And then at that point, I'm training things just like normal. So I'm just going to train them as a normal network and just update the parameters in the direction of the negative gradient. There was also one question I, I saw, I think, when I, when I closed my screen there, about whether or not this formula was correct if there are multiple equilibria. And it is still correct. It's a local gradient then. Um, and you also have to assume that you're not going, a small change, like an infinitesimal change, won't make you jump 
to a different uh, equilibrium point. But if you're as long as you're not at one of those points, this is still actually a valid local local gradient. All right, is that, is that clarifying all the questions? Are there any, were there any follow-ups from that? Okay, perfect. That's good. Yeah. So the big question of all this though is, you know, to a certain, so, so, so this is how we train a deck. This is how we sort of uh, train a deck. We train it with, I guess I should, you know, I should maybe make one more hour to loop there so to clarify that, you know, this is a this, this is the forward and backward pass that then runs within a stochastic gradient descent procedure. But after that, training is exactly the same as any other deep network. It's just that we only have you know one layer to train as opposed to a huge number of layers, or I guess maybe an infinite number of layers depending on your perspective. It could be really either one. Um, okay, so uh, the big question though with all this is is does it actually work? Um, Will this actually work in practice if we run it on, you know, reasonably large scale tasks? And the answer for these deck models is, is yes. So um, we have a few experiments on, on these things, uh, one of which I'll highlight in some detail and other ones I'll just sort of mention. Um, but for a task like language modeling, so we, we actually used a deck version of a transformer. So again, our, our one layer here was like a self-attention layer followed by a, a feed forward layer. Um, so, you know, a, sort of a transformer block was kind of our one layer. I guess it's really sort of two layers or maybe even three layers, but um, you know, one cell, I guess, is the, is the idea. So we applied this to um, the problem of language modeling, which uh, on the Wikitex 103 data set, which is a standard, you know, fairly large scale data set for, for language modeling. Um, and we compared it to uh, the transformer XL, which is a standard uh, method for, for you know, a very competitive baseline uh, for language modeling. And I'm going to compare these two things in terms of um, their uh, perplexity they get. That's how sort of how good they are at the language modeling task. The number is sort of irrelevant. It's just lower is better here. As well as the memory they use during training. So this is actually a very important point um, that, I, that, 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 I, that I want to emphasize now. I actually didn't really emphasize this maybe as, as much as I should have during the, the presentation. Because we only have one hidden layer, our memory, and, be, and because we're not storing intermediate computations anywhere in this, in this procedure, the memory of a DEC model is actually constant. It does not increase with the you know, effective depth because in fact the depth is infinite. This means that for the same size model, you have a much lower memory footprint than you would for traditional deep network where you have to store all those intermediate um, values in order to compute backpropagation. So I'm going to show these things both in terms of perplexity, in terms of memory, um, and we'll see how this looks. And what I'm going to do in particular is I'm going to show a bunch of different sized models uh, for different numbers of parameters, like you know a small model. Uh, so for a small model, um, you know the the transformer XL uses 4.8 gigabytes of memory. Um, I mean that's, that's that's for some batch size, et cetera. But just you know, standardize the batch size and things like this. Um, and we're and, and actually we're able to you know for for a small model with five million parameters, we're able to both improve the perplexity and significantly improve the the memory consumption. Um, the same thing happens for a trellis net. As kind of mentioned, that was some of our previous work on a a, a kind of a, a a combination between convolutional and recurrent networks. Um, we're again able to improve the perplexity while, uh, in this case, actually rather drastically reducing memory consumption. We actually had very deep, this was a 70 layer network, so it was actually quite deep. Um, and then even on the larger models or you know, large-ish models, uh, I guess they call them medium uh, in, the, in the language, of, of, uh, <laughs> in language of, of certain large companies that can, have, can, can, can do truly large models. Um, even here with 72 million parameters, and this is about as big as you can fit on the GPUs that we have, um, you're still able to, to substantially improve upon the performance of these existing transformer XL models. Now, I do want to clarify actually that, that this is not, the, these numbers here are not the state of the art for those things. They're showing kind of comparisons for the equal number of parameters. Uh, if you have models that, that are bigger than what we can train and they actually are, we're trained on TPUs, um, you can improve that perplexity still. And I think actually even, even uh, bigger companies are, are building even bigger transformer models these days. So, so you can actually um, can improve upon that even further. Uh, but for the same size model, um, you know, we're pretty consistently able to, to both improve perplexity and drastically cut, cut memory. Um, 
So this is this is a very nice, very nice feature of the model. Now I'm not gonna not gonna mention it here, but I I, I want to mention two notes. Uh, the first thing is this also works perfectly well for com, uh, ComNet or Vision domains. Um, you have to apply some tricks there, which I which I won't get into. We have a preprint right now under review on this, but uh, with some tricks, you with these same implicit layers, uh, with one you know with one layer or sort of one you know, cell maybe, um, you can get equivalent performance to things like ResNet 50 or ResNet 101 models on ImageNet. Um, uh, and near state of the art on on tasks like the cityscapes image segmentation. Um, so this is not just confined to just say sequence modeling. This is a general technique that works really for any style of network. Now, one point though that I want to make um, is that these things, however, are slower than traditional networks. Um, so so you know I'm showing memory there. That's great, but we actually are trading off some speed to get that memory improvement, uh, and I guess also the performance improvement. Um, and the reason why is that in order to apply that implicit function theorem, you need to um, typically run, you know, with your root solving method, you need to you need to call typically more iterations of your forward pass than most typical deep networks do. Um, and the reason why is that you have to actually be pretty close. Not not exactly there. I mean, you can certainly have some error, but you have to be pretty close to the convergence point to, uh, to the to equilibrium to really um, apply that implicit function theorem and get a correct gradient out. Of course, you can you know vary that epsilon of how much you do, and we, we we do tune that epsilon to be kind of as fast as we can be while still getting good performance. Um, but you need to typically call more forward iterations than 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 in a standard model. So this is going to be the big crux, I think, of these methods, um, is that we, we do actually still need to do more compute. Um, they're not hugely worse. It's, you know, 1.5 to 2 times slower for inference, uh, 2.3, uh, 2, to, 2 to 3 times slower for, for training. Um, uh, but it is slower. The second thing I want to point out about these, these, these models, though, um, is, uh, and, and, uh, is, is the, the sort of the theory that we have about them. So I, I won't prove this. We actually have both these proofs are in the paper. Uh, I've also given them in other talks. You can probably actually you know, Google for this and, and, and find some, some quick sort of proofs of these things. Um, but the first theorem that we have about DEX is, is and, and I sort of titled this under uh, one layer being all you need. I guess it's all the rage to say sort of, you know, X is all you need uh, for deep networks these days. But, you know, in our case, one layer is really all you need. Um, <laughs> we can even prove it. So, so the, the first proof there is that, that actually a single layer um, deck can represent any feed forward network that I described before. And, and the, the, the way you do this is you sort of think about a network that stacks all the intermediate hidden layers together and let kind of this one function be sort of a shifted application of all the layers. Now, it's very important. This is not a good thing to do in practice because while it's possible in theory, you lose the entire memory advantage and you actually lose com the compute advantage too. So this is actually an awful idea to actually really do. But in theory, it actually shows that you can represent these things. You know, the, the, the repeated iteration of these things to convergence is an inherently more powerful operator than a single nonlinearity like you have in a traditional network. The other theorem is that, so that's sort of, you know, the th theorem one says that the, the, the single layer deck is, you know, is sort of necessary, right? Uh, the, the theorem two says the single layer deck is also sufficient in that um, you, you don't get any benefit by, you know, stacking multiple decks. Despite the word that you know, a stacked deck would be a great title for a paper, but unfortunately, uh, or maybe fortunately, uh, as far as uh, paper title puns go, um, there's no benefit for this. They actually don't get any benefit from stacking them. And it's actually also a very simple argument there. The idea is that two equilibrium models actually can always be combined into a single equilibrium model with the layers kind of stacked together. So not stacking the actual, um, uh, the actual computation, but just the layers, uh, sort of the, 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 the fixed point layer being stacked together. Um, and so, and so, there's no real advantage just you know uh, having deep decks uh, or or stacks decks. Those those despite being cool names are unfortunately not that useful. But uh, there's, there's a couple of questions. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So so one of them uh, is asking for some intuition, and and the question is, why do you think that the equilibrium point is the best potential representation? Because it seems like the mutual information to X is continuously decreasing ah, okay, that's a great question. transformation. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So that is what happens in most deep networks, right? So most deep networks, as you get farther away from the input, uh, you lose you know, dependence on the input. This is why the input injection here is really important. So in the deck model, 
you are always re-injecting the input back into the current layer. This is not a, a minor thing. Because, of course, if you don't have input injection, then your final, and, and, and if say there were a unique fixed point, then the final fixed point would not depend on the input at all. It would be irrespective of the input. And so you couldn't, I mean, of course it wouldn't work, right? Um, so this is actually a really important point. This is why we use input injection. It's not like a small trivial thing. It's necessary to increase this or, 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 or to continue this dependence on the input all the way to the fixed point. Um, so the uh, a second question is about this backward pass, and yeah, um, it and the question is is can we avoid doing that inversion? Right. So we don't actually, and, and I mentioned this briefly um, here, but it might have probably gotten lost in the in the discussion. Um, we don't actually do a direct solve there. So we're going to do an indirect solve um, to actually compute that fixed point. In other words, we're going to use the indirect method that just requires multiplication by that term in the inverse, not actually forming and inverting that matrix. And the reason why it's sort of obvious, right? That's just too big to actually form and invert there. But, uh, and um, there's actually a very nice correspondence between the forward pass iterations and the backward pass iterations. If you think about uh, like, like the iterative method, if you think about um, solving for this, this linear system, in using an indirect in an indirect fashion, actually solving this linear system here in an indirect fashion. So we're not going to store that. We're going to use an inexact or, or an indirect method. I mean, you can also use things like conjugate gradient and stuff like that. We end up using Broin's method just because it sort of corresponds nicely to the forward pass as well. Um, but you use an indirect solver uh, to to do that. Now, the important point I want to make though is that the backward pass then involves the solution of a linear system. The forward pass, on their hand, involves a solution of a nonlinear system. It turns out that actually the backward pass tends to often be easier to solve than the forward pass, even with this indirect method. So using Broyden's method for the backward pass typically converges faster, not always, but, but, but often converges faster than the corresponding forward pass. So it actually is not that, I mean, it's still an iterative procedure to compute the backward pass, just like the forward pass, but it's still a very efficient one. Okay. Um... The, then there's a comment which says that although you cannot, perhaps you can't write a paper called stack decks, how about a paper, there's no point in a stacked deck? Yeah, so we actually, that, that, that theorem is already in the deck paper. Uh, so we've, already, we've already ruined, burned that bridge, I guess, unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> okay, and, and, and then one final question, which is that um, how about viewing W as a preconditioner and thinking about yeah. the effect uh, in terms of speeding up the root finding operation. That's, that's a great idea. And uh, I don't have time to get too much of that. We, we thought about these things a lot. So it's not quite W you want. You want like a, like, like a uh, I mean, it, it's sort of a diagonal scaling of W that's the true Hessian here. Um, and so you would love to be able to do that. Uh, I think actually the procedures I'm gonna describe in the next section, um, so there aren't too much detail, so I won't really see it that way. They actually can be viewed very much as better root finders using things like preconditioners. So there's actually a very strong connection there. And I mean, even more than that, you probably don't want to use W, you want to use W inverse or something like this, or you know, I minus W inverse, things like this. But that's that that actually is a great, a great direction for speeding these things up. Uh, and, and, and a wonderful direction to kind of see if we can do even better than what we're doing in the next section. Okay, so now let me um, finish. And I'm, I'm, I'm uh, so I didn't have that many slides, but still going kind of, still, still sort of behind where I want to be. So, so now this question that was asked before is, okay, this sounds great, but this seems really heuristic, right? Because how do you know this equilibrium point exists? Um, is it going to be unique? Are you going to be able to find it stably? I mean, what on earth, you know, this, this seems like we're just, you know, uh, trading off, <laughs> deep learning is heuristic enough, I'll say, with, you know, training and such. Do we really want to be heuristic in even the computation of the forward pass? And I, and I agree with this. So now I'm actually going to enter my, my second portion of the talk. Again, my outline was, uh, I think, uh, removed here, but um, which talks about how we can actually address this question of stability, uh, uniqueness, and existence using uh, techniques from monotone operator theory. So, so uh, I guess you can sort of strap in briefly and kind of go from there. 
So the question here is, what can we say about this fixed point? Right? Can we say, you know, in general, this this function is a generic is, is a general nonlinear dynamical system, and we sort of know from many many years of control theory that it's really hard to say things about general uh, you know nonlinear fixed point iterations. Right? This is this is extremely hard to say anything about, and. If you did want to, maybe not quite this form, but if you have a more general form of you know, an arbitrary nonlinear function there, then typically ensuring convergence requires some very strong conditions, like you know, strong Lipschitz bounds on, on W, which you don't want to actually constrain your, you know, which, which, which constrain your uh, representation too much. Um, eigenvalue conditions also, so, so Laurent Algawi in his work looked at eigenvalue conditions. Or even sometimes, you know, th th there's a whole suite of tools from control theory on verifying stability of nonlinear systems. But these are typically, you know, applicable to much smaller systems than the, the, the deep networks that we typically want to actually run in practice here. So, so what can we say about these things? Um, and maybe what can we say about a, a, a better way of finding these fixed points? It turns out that the theory of uh, monotone operators um, uh, actually provides a wonderful set of answers to these questions. Um, so I, I unfortunately don't have time to do sort of a, an overview of monotone operator theory here. Uh, monotone operator theory is sort of this, this, this beautiful framework that lets us actually derive, and you know, if you want the, I guess if you want the, um, the, the great big tomb of knowledge on this, um, you can read this uh, Baskin, um, Combet uh, have this, I hope I'm pronouncing those names right, I'm probably not, but um, they have this sort of big tomb on uh, monotone operator theory and Hilbert spaces. Uh, if you want a little bit more gentle injection, actually, uh, 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 Ernest Ryu and Stephen Boyd had a great uh, primer from a few years ago on sort of the more practical aspects of, uh, of, operator, of monotone operator methods. Uh, I'm going to give. I'm going to show the main result that we need for these things, but um, but uh, just know that, that, that there's a very deep theory here. You can use them to derive all our favorite convex optimization methods. So things like prox gradient methods, ADMM, or actually really any operator splitting method in general uh, can be derived with monotone operator methods, and and it really is um, a, a beautiful a beautiful body of work. Uh, there's also, as I mentioned, sort of related work actually in the context of deep learning. So that so so in fact, one of the authors of this tomb um, has also worked a little bit on deep networks that sort of how these connect to it, and it's actually very, uh, you know, um, we're very much inspired by this work uh, to, to 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 think about these connections here. Um, but the key the key result that we're actually going to use is uh, from and, and, and you know I, I won't go into the details of this. They they will be in the forthcoming preprint. Um, but at a high level. Um, here's the key result we need uh, for monotone operators. So, and and you know, hopefully, even if the details here are not are not quite concrete, uh, the, the the main points will still come out from this. So, what monotone operator theory says is that let's def if we define two. I mean, it says many things, but among many things, it says is that if we define two operators. So let's say we have a linear operator, which I'm defining a z. Uh, is equal to some linear function cz plus d. So it's a linear function of z. Importantly, with c being positive definite here. So that's actually going to be a, an important constraint here, the positive definiteness of c. Um, and then b uh, of z is actually the sub-differential operator of some complex function f. So you, know, you evaluate f of z, and you take its, its sub-different. It, it, it's uh, it's sub-differential. Then it turns out that z is the unique zero of the system. It's unique because, and, and in this case, c is, is strictly positive definite, but there's a unique zero of the system. Uh, zero equals the, you know, the, the sum of these two operators applied to z. If and only if it satisfies, this, this z satisfies a fixed point condition. And the fixed point condition it satis has to satisfy is that z has to equal the prox operator applied to z minus some step size alpha of cz plus d. And actually, so satisfy that for, for at the fixed point, at least it will satisfy that for any um, for any alpha. Okay, so um, what's the connection here to deck to deck models? The connection here is that we can, in a similar way, um, characterize exactly when there ex well, sorry, not exactly. We can give a sufficient condition for there to be a unique fixed point of this system. This z star equals ws because that is exactly of the form of that looks you know very much like this fixed point of a prox operator, and so in particular, just you know some very simple manipulation. Now you can show that if 
I minus W. So we actually, because you have the Z minus alpha times C, right? It actually ends up being an uh, I minus W term that, 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 that corresponds to your linear system. But if I minus W is strictly positive definite, and your nonlinear you choose is the prox operator for some convex fun function F, in these settings, you, can, you, you, you do guarantee that there exists a unique fixed point of this system. Okay, so that's, that's the connection to DEX, is that what monotone operator theory tells us is that even if these functions are nonlinear, they essentially correspond to something like solving uh, an optimization problem, even though W is not to be symmetric here. So oh, by the way, W is not symmetric here. So uh, I minus W being positive definite, that means that that plus that transpose is positive definite. Um, what this tells us is it you know, gives us a sufficient condition for even though the system is, is, is nonlinear, it tells us this will guarantee there is a unique fixed point to the system. So now the question I think is obviously is, are those two conditions realistic? This is something we actually would you know, feasibly apply um, in, a, in a real model. And I'll sort of answer this in two. So the, the, the first question is, you know, are prox operators good nonlinearities? And, and the answer is that I think this is actually quite, quite definitely yes. So uh, there's actually this, 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 this previous work by the, the I think it's actually went through a bunch of them. It's also been uh, worked since then, kind of actually finding a lot of uh, nonlinearities in terms of prox operators. Uh, so it's, you know, hopefully it's actually very apparent that the prox operator for the indicator of the, um, the positive set, that actually is the ReLU. So it's, it's the projection onto the, the, you know, the prox of an indicator is actually a projection operator. So um, the, the, the ReLU actually is the projection onto the positive orthant, which is exactly the prox operator for this indicator function. So that actually is an exact one. It turns out you can also very, very closely approximate most other uh, nonlinearities that actually use in practice. So like a soft plus, you can approximate uh, uh, also with these things with, with, with a log function. A tan h you can approximate as the prox of the log of one plus x squared of these things. Um, so so th th these are not really obvious. You have to sort of just you know, plot them to see. But this actually does show that you know, these prox operators are pretty good, um, pretty good representations of sort of nonlinearities. And I think actually you could probably come, I mean, as, as long as, because proxy operators are always monotonic and increasing, there are some, some conditions there, but for, for most of those activations, you can basically find a prox operator that pretty much approximates it. So the first one is actually no problem, is that prox operators being on linearities. The second one is actually quite a bit trickier. So the second one says, is it realistic to assume or require that uh, our weight matrix is, or really I minus the weight matrix is positive definite? Um, and this is not realistic. Uh, it actually does happen to be true uh, that in most random initializations, this will hold. So it actually does hold most of the time. This is the case. But as you train, as you take gradient steps in W, uh, if W is unconstrained, it will quickly cause it to be violated. Now you could sort of limit it by like, you know, if, if, if you regularize the Lipschitz constant a lot, or the you know spectral norm of W, if it's less than one, then you still have that and things like this. But those are actually too stringent, I think, of conditions. Um, you often want actually the Lipschitz constant W to be fairly large. Um, and so instead, what we can show is there's actually a way, there's actually a different trick you can do, uh, which I think is much cleaner. And the trick is we can actually just parameterize W exactly in a way that will always enforce this condition. So W basically is, you know, uh, the identity minus a positive definite matrix plus an anti-symmetric matrix. So again, W cannot, doesn't have to be symmetric. So you can have an anti-symmetric portion and that can be whatever it wants, but the symmetric portion has to be positive definite, or at least, you know, I minus that portion has to be positive definite. And so if we wanted to print that, let's just print that directly, right? Um, F has to have some structure. I mean, you, you could make F like a, like a you know, triangular to have it be like a Chelsea decomposition, but it doesn't really matter. You have to just sort of be a little careful about conditioning. And as long as you are, this is a very nice form that for any, without any sort of projections, without any sort of other operators, you, you, you get a W that always obeys this condition. And, and this one turns to work, uh, turns out uh, to work quite well in practice and much better than sort of uh, any sort of projection or other operations we tried. So now um, I kind of want to summarize all this by just highlighting here these two main advantages of formulating a deck in this manner, basically motivated by, by uh, monotone operator theory. So the first one is what I've already implied, right? So, so by parameters of deck in this manner, we can guarantee that there is a unique fixed point 
um, this thing. Now, actually, I should mention again, this does not necessarily mean that the fixed point iteration, if I just iterate that equation, it was not necessarily going to be stable. You actually have to, um, you might have to um, sort of damp that iteration to actually make it stable, but it does guarantee the existence of a unique fixed point. Um, secondly, we can also use, and, and this is maybe the even better thing, so that, 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 that first point is kind of nice, but getting back to these questions on, um, on uh, you know, preconditioning and stuff like this, because now, we've actually characterized our fixed point in terms really of an operator splitting problem. It's really these two monotone operators that we've you know, tried to find a zero jointly of. This is a classical problem called an operator splitting problem. Um, and there are very classical methods for finding this, uh, finding these fixed points. Um, for example, the forward backward, Unfortunate naming, nothing to do with the forward backward of an actual neural network, but that's a forward backward in a different sense, um, is, is one of these sort of standard approaches. Uh, Peaceman Rackford is another one. You may have heard of Douglas Rackford. ADMM is an operating splitting approach too. So these all can be used to find the fixed point Z star. And some of them even um, can also actually be guaranteed to converge linearly uh, to find them. Now, there is one sort of detail here, like, uh, and this, I think, actually gets back to very much this notion of preconditioning. So you sort of have to think of, like, the inverse of the weight matrix as a sort of a good conditioner. And it turns out that some of the more involved operator display methods, like Peaceman Rackford, they actually require that you do invert this operator W, or at least multiply by the inverse of it, um, or some regularized inverse of it, um, which can be challenging for things like convolutional networks, right? So how, how do you, in, I mean, if it's, if it's a matrix, it's small, you just invert it. But if it's a, if, if, if it's a you know, convolutional network, how do you do that? But it turns out actually you can do those inversions also using things like the FFT, and they're, they're actually quite efficient in practice. And so um, one very nice thing about this is that you can kind of tile this together to get very structured kind of complex models that still obey this form of having a guaranteed unique fixed point that we know we will converge to linearly by applying the algorithms. Um, now, um, I'll just sort of give some initial results here on that. Um, we actually applied, to, so we're, we're, we're doing some initial work right now, um, or, or have done it on, on you know, relatively small networks here. This isn't still the scale of um, just doing these inversions and everything like that. As, Makes takes a little bit outside the scale of our previous work at like with ImageNet and these sorts of things. We're sort of still in the CIFAR domains, but with a relatively small uh, problem, you can still, you know, a CIFAR problem, you can still construct these, you know, things like making W be a structured matrix here where the diagonal blocks correspond to square convolutions. Um, uh, so it's convolutions that, that produce the same number of channels as input and output, and that's sort of like, you know, this. This, this fixed point iteration. Um, and the, the off diagonal blocks correspond to like the down sampling. So this is kind of a, you know, a structured version of sort of like a multi-resolution uh, Lynette-like architecture, right? With, with down sampling and, and, and convolutions, you just iterate it to convergence um, instead of just iterating it, you know, a couple times. Um, with this form, it gets a bit trickier to enforce things like the PSD form of IMSW, um, but you can do it and you can also compute their inverses via the FFT. Again, it's a little trickier because it involves like combining those strided matrices and, 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 norm and normal ones, but, but it actually is, is quite doable. Um, and we actually do in fact do that and we, and we compute all our fixed point computation via um, Peaceman-Rackford. Um, and so that's, that's how we compute these, uh, these fixed points. And you know, in terms of performance, it's actually it's actually it's it's, it's fine. It's nothing earth shattering, certainly. So we get you know things like eighty eight percent accuracy on CFAR. Uh, but but, then, but a couple couple comments here. First of all, this is a fairly small model. The two million parameters is a pretty small model. If we expand that, we can we can actually Im improve things. Uh, but it will take longer. Um, and the other thing is that this still you know if you compare this to the other implicit models that do have guarantees of convergence, it's still well beyond what it has. So in your neural ODE methods, uh, if you apply them to CIFAR, as far as I know, the best results are like in the high 60s of, of, of accuracy. Um, we have you know, a three-stage model here that's able to get reasonable accuracy on CIFAR. And you know, I think with a, with a little bit more tuning could definitely do, do better than that. In fact, our full MDEC models get, uh, sorry, sorry our, our, our full convolutional DEC models um, do match the performance, they just don't have this guarantee of the, of the monotone operators. Okay, so, 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 so I think this is sort of, uh, I'm, I'm incredibly excited about sort of the, the, the future of this direction here. 
because we there's this this sort of new paradigm of of deep learning in some way. I guess I mean, is it even deep learning? That's sort of hard to say, right? Um, uh, these deep equilibrium models, in some sense, they show that one layer is all you need. Even uh, and and you can match state of the art performance with one of these single implicit layers, and you get a vast amount of reduction in, in memory consumption. Um, their problem, though, is that there are things like convergence equilibrium. It's largely heuristic in nature. Um, they tend to because most networks tend to be stable themselves, but it's not guaranteed. And sometimes that that convergence requires a fair amount of tuning. On the other hand, now we're starting to bring this this theory from optimization and monotone operators to bear to get networks that do have this provable guarantees uh, about convergence to a fixed point. Um, and they will always converge to the fixed point. You can guarantee that even if the, you know, a natural, uh, even if the natural, I should say, forward iteration is unstable. Um, but as of yet, at least, they're not yet competitive with the more heuristic approaches. Um, but I think they offer this path forward to address the heuristic nature of DEX. And some combination of these two things, um, I think, is, is, is very feasible. Um, we can get to a point where we have, you know, well, uh, where we have very clearly defined networks that are going to have um, guaranteed to have a fixed point, which we can converge to, and which um, you know match the performance of our more heuristic DEC models. But from the highest level, what really excites me about this is this whole notion of rethinking what depth means. Because we've been so, I think, kind of focused on the notion of depth as inherently powerful that, which I think is, is useful, and, and depth is sort of different layers of abstraction is useful. But I also think there's this very important concept of depth as dynamical systems and uh, deep networks as kind of themselves maybe moving towards computing fixed points of, of nonlinear dynamical systems. Um, this is a very powerful paradigm that I think can, can you know, bring a different perspective on deep learning. And I think there's a ton of, of extremely interesting uh, and compelling work yet to be done in this area. So with that, let me end my show. I guess we're at time, but we're taking questions from the middle of the time. And uh, we can now answer any uh, follow-up questions. OK, so let me scroll through these. Um, OK, so. Uh, First of all, yes, I guess I guess that's that, that's the end of the talk. So 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 thanks everyone for listening. Uh, I'll try to answer some of the questions that I can that I can see uh, for the for the the, the thing here. But maybe um, yeah, okay. So I think I think we actually uh, found where the questions might have started. So um, so one. One person asks, uh, the application of W is constrained. So I guess, I mean, it's not really constrained. What, what it is, I mean, this is sort of the difference between like, you know, the, the, the hacky neural network view is that if you have some, you know, some constraint you want to enforce, you just, you just create a network that it has that constraint embedded in it, right? So the, the, the optimization in this case, so, so really what it is, is, you know, when, when I say now optimizing over W, I really, of course, mean optimizing over F and over G. Those are the two measures that make up uh, w. And for any value, it's unconstrained optimization over f and g. But doing that imposes this condition on w that guarantees the uniqueness, right? So it's, it's unconstrained optimization, but it is with the implicit bias that enforces this constraint on w. Uh, next question is when you restrict deck to such monotone operators, I guess you might lose the universal approximation property. Yes, I mean, uh, actually, actually uh, uh, no, actually, because um, a, a finite depth uh, fixed point, um, yeah, actually, that's not true. So a finite depth um, uh, network will always have um, a representation that is stable. So 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 where, where, where W is stable and you actually will get that W minus uh, W transpose is um, is uh, positive definite. Uh, that's actually not quite obvious because you basically have a, a, a strictly lower triangular matrix that sort of uh, enforces the, the, the sort of construct in the stacked form. But that's a little bit detailed. But you actually you actually still get that even though um, even though you um, you are doing this um, you are using the monotone operators. Um, okay, so let me see any questions. I thought about how to interpret uh, the deck, a single deck layer. Um, 
Yeah. So, so no, um, we haven't like looked at visualizing, visualizing this. I think this should be a great, a great, like, I should probably give that to a, to a, to a student kind of soon. Um, I think it's actually a, a super interesting idea. I mean, you know, do, is there any sort of like when you, when you use normal visualization to visualize a deck and what, the, what those filters are doing, uh, be, 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 to, be, be totally, totally doable. Um, uh, yeah, I think I only have one more question. Um, uh, so, uh, potential help with distillation, yes, absolutely. So actually, there are some interesting types of distillation here, but, but that's actually not that. I, th I, I think we haven't done too much. Um, so that's what Remy asked. Um, Noah asks, um, and actually Theo asked something similar. So are decks more explainable? Uh, with, without knowing what explainability means or having any sort of uh, tools in those games, I will, I will, I will just say definitely not. <laughs> uh, there's, there's definitely no, I mean, I mean maybe, but I, I, have no, I have no sort of uh, way to claim that yet. Um, and then Noah uh, says, "Can can uh, solving for fixed point be viewed as solving monotone variation on quality?" Yes, exactly. So this is, is this is an operator splitting problem that is exactly the you know a, a class of, of monotone variation inequality. So that so that's what finding the fixed point of these uh, monotone decks is. Um, just different terminologies for the same thing. Yeah. Okay, so I think those are all the questions, and uh, Nancy is hounding me to to finish up. So I will finish up now. What I will say is, we if you are interested, um, I'll I'll. We're putting up the preprint on the monotone operator decks fairly soon. Uh, if you want that, send me an email. I'll let you know when we put it up, or you can, you know, be the uh, scanning archive for it. Um, and and if you're interested in these things, by all means, uh, send me an email, and I'd love to chat more. Thank Thanks, you. everyone.